is, uh, everyone, this is Noah Diffenbaugh at Stanford University, and uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, for this Hangouts on Air uh, to discuss the uh, severe weather that's been happening in the United States this week. Uh, we have heat waves, fires, uh, severe storms, um, and uh, we're here to discuss uh, uh, the specifics of those, of those events, uh, the, how they fit within the, the larger statistical context, and how um, climate change may or may not be, be playing a role. Um, but uh, I'm co-hosting this with Andrew Friedman from uh, Climate Central. And um, if you, if you want to get in uh, to the Hangout, go ahead and uh, post a comment on my Google Plus uh, stream, and I'll uh, try to get you into the into the invite circle. All right, uh, Andrew, you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself first? Sure. Um, it's good to be here. I'm Andrew Friedman. I'm a, a senior science writer with Climate Central, um, which is a nonpartisan group that uh, does science research as well as journalism work on uh, climate change. So I've been covering the uh, this particular heat wave and severe weather. Um, it's seemingly endless heat wave, uh, just from having to write so many stories about it um, over the past uh, more than a month now. And uh, yeah, so it's good to talk to you guys. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, all right, we have uh, a couple uh, others in the Hangout now. Uh, Doug, you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Doug Stetson. I'm a physician. Uh, I have had uh, a lot of experience working with the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security, most recently on issues that have to do with bioterrorism surveillance. And uh, this particular kind of topic is one that strikes me as of interest to the federal government on a policy basis, and I'd like to hear how it's developing. Awesome. I'm very glad you could be here. Uh, Stuart O'Neill has joined. Stuart, can you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Oh, sorry, Stuart, we, uh, we can't hear your volume. Uh, all right, Stuart has dropped out. He may, he may be back with a mic. We'll see. Um, all right, so uh, Andrew, um, given that you've been, been writing about this uh, all week, um, uh, what, what can you tell us about uh, the, the details of, of uh, the heat wave that's, that's been going on in the U.S.? Um, well, for, fortunately, it's, it's on its way out. Um, if you can wait till Sunday or Monday. Um, being located in Princeton, New Jersey, I, I can't because I don't really want to face the outside uh, in a little while. But, uh, you know, we've set or exceeded uh, 3,200 daily record high temperatures in June, uh, around 160 all-time records, around 155 of those were 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Um, and we are continuing that this week. At last check, Chicago was two degrees below their all-time high temperature record, uh, sitting there at 103. So it's it's just been a fascinating event. And you know, I rely on people like Noah to to work telling us you know how the climate is going to shift and make heat waves like this more likely, and whether that is already happening. Um, and I'm more like reporting on what the evidence is and sort of now casting the event. Yes, it's, uh, sorry, Stuart, Stuart's back in. So Stuart, uh, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm pretty sure you can hear me this time, right? Yes. Well, Tech 101 here. Um, I'm fascinated by the whole subject because I see it in the West out here as dramatic droughts. Um, killing farms, uh, killing ranches where they simply can't produce. And so I'm very interested in the entire topic and the controversy around it. I think there's lots to be learned, and I look forward to learning tonight. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, yeah, I think from the, from the perspective of climate change, both you know, with regard to that introduction and, and, and what Andrew said, um, you know, for the Certainly, for you know, the heat wave that's that's uh, been been uh, kind of parked over over the central and eastern U.S. this week, 
uh, as well as for uh, the drought and heat that's been in, in uh, southwest U.S. and, and fires that have, um, that have been taking place. You know, I get a lot of questions uh, about, you know, what, you know, what's the, how might, how might global warming affect these kinds of events? What's the role of global warming in making these uh, events more or less likely uh, right now? And, uh, you know, these, these kinds of events are actually, you know, of, of all the possible extreme events that, that we experience, uh, these heat-related ones are really um, where we have kind of the most robust understanding of, of the role of, of global warming. Um, so, you know, we, we published, um, you know, a number of papers over the last couple of years, both in my group and, and obviously the broader community that really point to these kinds of events being um, you know, not only uh, responsive to continued global warming, but also uh, changing in, in, in frequency and character as a result of the global warming that's already occurred. Uh, so uh, certainly this, the, the kind of record high temperatures that, that Andrew is talking about, uh, there's been a lot of work on, on those kind of heat extremes. And um, we know very robustly that those are, are becoming more common and in fact that, um, that that's very consistent with what we'd expect from, from global warming. Um, uh, Doug, did you did you have any questions at this point? Well, yeah, I'm I'm just very interested in the, and I'm not disputing by the way, but I'm interested in the kind of statement that we know robustly that these kinds of events are more common and are consistent with global warming. Um, how how can I say that in plainer language? Um. Well, so you know, if we think about temperature, temperature varies. You know, and certainly we, we experience it varying on a daily basis, right? It's the sun. The sun comes out in the day and it's warmer uh, where we are, and the sun goes down and it's cooler, and that that's the daily cycle. Uh, and we know that it varies uh, during the year, and so it's it's warmer in the summer than it is in the winter, um, certainly outside of the tropics. Um, and we know that it varies from year to year. Uh, there are years where where June is warmer, years where where June is cooler, and uh, these variations create uh, what we call variability uh, in in um, the temperature, um, and that variability has some distribution. So you can think for temperature; it's not not necessarily a case for for um, precipitation or or snowfall or or the number of hurricanes or a whole bunch of other climate phenomenon. But for temperature, it's a pretty um, normal distribution. So you can think about a bell curve. So uh, there's a typical normal temperature for June. Sorry? So there's a typical normal temperature for June. And well, there's, there's the typical... Further out on the curve are less likely. Right. So, so if you're wherever it is that you live, there's a typical temperature for June, but there's a distribution of temperatures if you look over... Um, a decade or 30 years or a century, uh, there's a distribution. And so, you know, what Andrew was talking about earlier about the record high temperature, that's the extreme of all of the, the days of all of the years that have been recorded. Right? So that's, the, that's the, the tail of the recorded distribution. Um, so if, it, if a daily temperature exceeds that, uh, then that, that's the record high, a new record high temperature. So uh, th those are, uh, we, and we can measure how far removed from, quote, normal those yeah. records are. So, so can we say something like the uh, average June temperature for give the spot that you're using has been above the distribution for the last, say, 50 years in each of the last 10? Is that kind of statement available? Yeah, so actually, so we, we uh, a co-author and I published, um, published a study of this actually last year. It came out about this time, June last year. And we looked at um, different areas of the globe and looked at, at observations of temperature. And um, we asked if we, if we look at the, the recent decades, and compare those with the, the decades prior. So look at the late 20th century and compare it with the middle of 20th century, for example. And we ask, what's the hottest summer season that occurred in the middle 20th century? And then just 
uh, count up the number of seasons that were hotter than that hottest season uh, during the late 20th century. Yeah, we, we actually did document that uh, regions all around the globe are experiencing much more frequent occurrence of what used to be that extreme season, the hottest season. And there have been other uh, similar studies that have been done, uh, for example, on um, record high temperatures in the U.S., how many record high temperatures have been set in recent decades versus record low temperatures, and the many, many, many more record high temperatures have been set. Uh, so that the analysis of the analysis of the observational record has been done. It continues to be done and continues to change as we have more and more uh, years uh, going through time. But uh, the, for for uh, extreme heat, uh, the, that that record is actually quite clearly shows that that there are are increasing uh, trends in in the occurrence of extreme heat. Uh, no. Yeah. Can't, you, can't you narrow that down even further? Well, first of all, don't we have 100-year records uh, in most areas or thereabouts? The first part of my question. Do, don't we have 100 years worth of data that's pretty accurate to deal with? Yeah, so the, the length of record varies um, by location. In fact, there mm -hmm. are records in Europe that are, that are multiple centuries um, uh, of, of direct temperature measurements. So... Um, that, that record length varies depending on how long ago somebody you know, put a thermometer uh, at sure. a location, essentially. Um, I guess the, the second half of my question is, can, is isn't it possible, because it seems logical to me, to narrow that down, for instance, uh, in Tucson, which is a routinely a very hot summer climate, if, if they go off the deep end uh, for two, three years, their water supplies for five years or seven years, their water supplies dry up. We've been in it just now broken a drought in California, which isn't obvious because we import our water. <laughs> but uh, we just uh, we just broke a drought in California that had been going on for five years. And I, I wonder when the last time that happened, I mean, I'm aware of it last century. I mean, in the night, in uh, in 1864 thereabouts, and, and one right after that, but I'm not aware of it being a routine occurrence. I mean, isn't that important information for people to have? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's no, it's very important. And, and in fact, um, you know, our taxpayer dollars go to, to helping to create that information. So, for example, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, receives, receives taxpayer money. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a government agency. Um, and, and one of its one of its roles, in, in addition to um, you know running the National Weather Service, is uh, to gather climate observations from uh, around the United States and uh, make sure that you know, confirm that those uh, observations are um, accurate, and then to synthesize the observations. Uh, you know, it, in ways that, that people can can uh, answer these kinds of questions, and a lot of the a lot of the numbers that, that Andrew was talking about earlier, in terms of the number of records that have been set and, and the spatial pattern of those of of, of, of those records, um, you know, in terms of which parts of the country are, are seeing more of those records, those come from from uh, the information that's been gathered by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think you're absolutely right, and, and a lot of that information is now available via the internet, um, uh, again, supported. Well, also, also in the agricultural county extensions in the areas where they exist, uh, I think plenty of farmers and ranchers now are really learning to pay attention to, um, to the computerized studies before they go about doing anything. It's a very interesting phenomenon. When you see land being labeled with a laser instead of with a tractor, <laughs> Or they're double checking the tractor. Then you know we've stepped into a new age. You know? Yeah, we've got the lasers and we've got the we've got the GPS uh, for for fertilizer applica fertilizer application, and yeah, it's a, it's amazing technology. Yeah. Uh, it looks like uh, Carlos has has joined us. Carlos, could uh, you want to introduce yourself real quick? I don't know if we have uh, may not have um, volume on Carlos. Um, oh, hello. Oh, hey, Carlos. Uh, can you introduce yourself, Carlos? 
Hey, no, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties earlier. Uh, my name is Carlos Ochoa. I'm the director of the Office for Campus Sustainability here at the University of Arkansas. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Um, do you have any, any questions at this point? Well, I don't know if you've already addressed the, uh, the wildfires in Colorado, and maybe it's uh, linked to um, the climate change. That's kind of what I, I was hoping that maybe you could address a little bit. Okay, yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question, um, and you know, I think fires are, fires are an interesting, um, interesting kind of impact, impact question because there's clearly a climate component, um, both from temperature and winds and moisture, so you know, how dry are the soils, how dry is the vegetation, and, and uh, you know, in the western U.S. Uh, where, where we have the fires going now um, that have been in the news a lot in Colorado, for example, uh, the snowpack plays a big role in in how dry the spring is, um, in addition to just uh, rainfall and temperature in the spring. So, uh, you know, even just just on the environmental side, the kind of climate-related components, there there are a lot of factors. And then you also have the human component that that makes for a very important overlay. So, the ignition you can have wildfires that start from um, from lightning, but but also uh, there's a lot of human ignition of, of people starting fires either intentionally or accidentally. Um, and then you also have the human component of the management of the landscape. Uh, so you know, we're, we're um, actively managing forests, um, whether it's uh, through thinning and controlled burn or whether it's through fire suppression or some combination of those. Uh, so I think, excuse me, no, I think that's a real open question as to whether we're managing the forest. I think there's a whole <laughs> hang out there with a bunch of people. Well, but I think I mean, there's a much larger you, fire burning in New Mexico right now. By the way, it's over 300,000 acres in New Mexico. Yeah, so it's not burning any houses, so we don't hear about it. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess when I say when I say managing, um, you know, I think we're, I, I think it's clear that we are whether we're whether we're uh, optimally or or, or suboptimally managing different forests. We're clearly managing them, even if we're just not allowing fire. Uh, to go into areas right. uh, for fire suppression, that's a form of management. Um, and so we, you know, we, as humans, we really are dominating dominating the landscape globally, and and that includes um, that includes our our either direct or indirect management of of forests. Uh, so, you know, there has been quite a bit of research on the question of of wildfire and and climate change in the Western U.S. And uh, Anthony Westerling led a paper in 2006 that. Um, documented changes in in wildfire in 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 uh, Western North America, and uh, found that not only uh, has wildfire been increasing, but that uh, uh, declining snowpack in the Western U.S. and also warming that that creates an earlier onset of the spring season uh, that those have contributed to to the increase in uh, wildfire so um, you know it's a it's a difficult problem because of that that human component but the evidence at this point is that um, not only not only are the kinds of, of uh, wildfire events that we're experiencing now likely to increase in the western US in the future as uh, snowpack declines and and temperature increases but also that the, the change in wildfire that have already been observed um, are linked to to climate changes that are attributable to to our human emissions and greenhouse gases. Um, no, the um, the Colorado fires, for example, the the there there are two links that that my reporting um, focused on in terms of something other than just how did this fire start. Um, you know, looking at the snowpack from uh, this past winter was uh, extremely low, uh, very thin snowpack, and it melted much earlier than average. Uh, the meltdown date, I think, was something like a month earlier than average. Uh, so, and now 100% uh, of Colorado is currently in severe drought conditions or worse. So you had that component. And, and the heat wave that really started in Colorado and, and kind of worked its way east to cover much of the country set a huge number of records. The state in the U.S. that set the most amount of temperature records in June was Colorado. Um, so that heat 
which again has some potential links to man-made influence, fed into you know the wildfire problem. It didn't make things easier for firefighters. It helped it be more susceptible to fire, and it also exacerbated the drought. It just sort of fed into it. So we're looking, like Noah said, at a lot of things going on at the same time, and it can sometimes be hard to figure it out or explain it. Um, and kind of, I think our temptation is to uh, blame it on one thing or the other. Um, there was a lot of wildfire coverage that was done by the by the mainstream media until this past week that really didn't mention climate change at all. Yes. Yeah, so the the uh, Carlos just. Uh, texted or chatted a question about the snowpack decline being attributable to climate change. And for the Western U.S., actually, this is, you know, these factors, these climate factors contributing to wildfire have, have really received um, some of the most uh, rigorous attention in terms of uh, what we call detection and attribution research. And I can explain those words if you want. By you guys. By you guys, not by the popular media. Sure. Yeah. No. I'm. No. I'm. I'm. I can only speak for myself uh, and my. You know, as scientists, uh, popular media is another question entirely. But, um, but in terms of you know the the the, the hydrology in the western U.S. and the, the snow the the snow dominated hydrology in the western U.S. This has actually been treated very rigorously, and the the signal that's seen in observations of snowpack and runoff. Uh, broadly over the western U.S. is those, th there are there are clear trends and that those trends are consistent with um, with uh, the physical uh, expectation from global warming and in fact um, without those, without those, without that global warming uh, it is not likely that the that the trends would would uh, be occurring. So that's the basis for the statement of, of uh, attribution to human caused global warming. Um, I want to uh, pause real quick, interject. Uh, we're talking about the, um, the recent uh, severe weather that's been occurring in, in the United States, and we have uh, someone else who's joined the Hangout. Um, you want to go, go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I am Som uh, Datta, and I'm a graduate student at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I study, uh, I study basically uh, CFD and its application in uh, hydraulics engineering, uh, but I have uh, interest in hydrology and weather-related stuff, too, so I thought I should listen to what you guys have to discuss. Oh, fantastic. Um, no, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, are there, um, we talked a bit about, about the heat wave in the central U.S., we talked a bit about the fires in the, in the western U.S., uh, there have been a number of articles um, just in this week, uh, this morning's New York Times, uh, Forbes recently, a couple other outlets about um, the potential effect of, of the current heat wave in the, in the central U.S. on the corn crop this year and, and corn prices. Uh, and that's something we actually um, published a paper on earlier this year. So uh, we can talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, are there other topics about the, about the current, current weather extremes that, that people have interest in? Uh, I can say that in California, well, we have um, our climate problems, and we have been in a drought. Uh, we're the luckiest state and the most aggressive about importing water from everywhere you can think of, and sometimes against other people's will. Uh, we've killed a number of valleys, but kept Los Angeles and Southern California alive. So. Uh, I think other places are, would be much more interesting about hydrology, et cetera, et cetera. Than, and I'm the non-scientist in the group here, so if I ask a stupid question, someone slap me around. Oh, no, not at all. No, the point is, the point is for us to have a discussion about what's on people's mind, no doubt. Um, um, the coast is of interest to me, direct interest to me. I don't understand how they could go from what they would normally have to these extraordinary temperatures combined with an extraordinary storm. I mean, is that in any way related? Is that, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Well, so, yeah, so when we ask, when we ask uh, a question like that, you know, our, our first, you know, we have a, what's called a null hypothesis. So the, the, the null hypothesis is that it's coincidence. 
that the the conditions that are making the, you know, the fires in the in the southwestern U.S. are independent from the conditions that are making the heat wave in the central U.S. and they're independent from the conditions that make the derecho storm in in the eastern U.S. and so that's the null hypothesis is that it happened by random chance and then the burden of proof for um, is on disproving that hypothesis and so we ask statistical questions, you know, what are the odds that, that these are, uh, that we can invalidate the null hypothesis that these are independent. Um, hmm. Now that being said, we, we have, um, you know, the scientific community has spent a lot of time under, uh, trying to understand these kinds of events, even independent of climate change, just, you know, for, for, um, from the perspective of, of the day-to-day -day weather that we experience. And, uh, because of all that work, we do have quite a bit of understanding about about the conditions that that uh, create these kinds of events, um, and so we can we can ask kind of more physical questions in addition just to those statistical questions. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, if we look back at the at the record of um, you know heat waves and 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 those kind of severe storms is the, the having having a heat wave of this magnitude and a storm of that magnitude is you know, we can expect we can expect that to occur uh, to some extent by by random chance um, and certainly over the central u s uh, you know there, there it's very very dry uh, atmosphere and and soil conditions now that um, you know are are actually suppressing rainfall there's a feedback from from uh, the soil moisture that's suppressing rainfall over over the Corn Belt, for example. Uh, on one thing on the derecho event, uh, I had an argument today with a colleague of whether or not uh, that word is going to continue in American uh, use or whether it's like a fad for one week. Um, but these types of events are characterized. They they often characterize really big heat waves in the United States. Um, just the way the weather patterns work. You have like a really dominant area of high pressure and then right along the edges of the high, there's the boundary between really warm and less warm conditions. And it's along that stationary front that these events really like to uh, ripple. Um, and we just hadn't seen one that intense to strike uh, such a populated area, such a vulnerable area uh, in a long time. Um, you know, they've happened before, they're very characteristic up in the upper Midwest especially, and they can sometimes account for a lot of the summer, for some of the summertime rainfall that helps farmers. But, uh, you know, this one was unusually destructive, possibly the most, uh, it was the largest non-hurricane power outage in Virginia and Maryland history. Um, you know, and instead of getting a three-day warning for, of a hurricane, they got a three-hour warning, um, so they couldn't preposition people to respond. Yeah, I think this the the issue of um, of what gets hit, what's underneath a storm or a heat wave. Um, I, I think that's really important in considering these questions about why are we seeing so more of these, and and uh, you know, there's there's a non-trivial component that has to do with media and social media, like we're we're uh, you know, taking advantage of now, um, and, and, and in addition to population, um, but just the fact that we can very quickly know about what's going on elsewhere, uh, I think has uh, I, I think it's it, it's you know it's uh, objectively clear that that that's increasing our awareness of of these kinds of events, and you know the the other end of that is if you know if if uh, exactly the same storm happens and there's and there's no one there then um, we're we're just not going to know about it right so the you know if that same you know the, it's the power outage that, that really and the, and the people that are affected and the, and the indirect effects um, the health effects for example of, of losing power that's really uh, heightened the awareness of of that event so I think it, it's non-trivial the the the, the media the media aspect of that and, and, and the humanitarian aspect of it. Um, uh, Stuart, um, you you uh, you're interested some in, in climate and homeland security, and is is that correct? Sorry, um, not Stuart. Yeah, Doug. Doug. I'm sorry, Doug. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> no, that's Doug. Uh, I am indeed. The the issue that strikes me as being central here 
is that the <clears throat> it seems to be the case that climate change is upon us. Or looking at it a little, you know, now old information, but thinking of Al Gore's uh, inconvenient truth, I think that what the man said was that if we simply stopped producing carbon dioxide tomorrow, that we would end up with a gradual and unexpectedly uh, great increase in world temperatures anyway. That the die is cast, that we're in this situation. And that makes me feel very much as though the most important question is not, are we there, which is one level where people are sort of wondering if they should accept this truth, or, yeah, it's happening, we want to stop it, which may be impossible, but, yeah, it's happening, and shouldn't we plan on what to do in the future. And this makes me think an awful lot about, um, I think it was Stuart O'Neill, who is one of the people who has to plan or thinks about planning where the next crops go or what they're going to be or would it maybe make sense to uh, buy a farm that's further north <laughs> or something like that. Who, who is taking this climate information and turning it into consequences that require public policy. But the public policy has to be accepted in order to be implemented, and I think that's where there's a major political component to this. Could agree more. We, we can't take, I mean, I'm not a rancher, a farmer, or anything like that. I'm just a Westerner and an old cowboy, but, um, you know, I have other businesses. But... I can tell you that the people, the, the dairy farms left Southern California because of the water costs and they moved to Idaho and that was 30 years ago and so they were paying attention to what we would now call maybe a weather event or hydrology, I don't know what the right word is guys, but they were paying attention to it then and now uh, to use another agricultural example, there were people that started to move from one place in the high desert, went to another place in the high desert, found their own water, uh, built alfalfa farms, which is extremely expensive, alfalfa ranch is extremely expensive to get your first crop up, and after that, it's a real money machine, um, and then found out they really didn't own the water. Uh, L.A. Uh, Municipal Water made that rather clear to them. And now they're out of business and trying to find cheap water somewhere. So it's already happening. And I think your comments about snowpack, I mean, we're out of our drought only because of a couple of years of heavy snowpack. That's it. Well, yeah, so, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes this summer. Um, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, obviously we have a huge political divide on the uh, climate change, on climate change questions. And that is impeding uh, sensible public policy, um, especially if you look at the North Carolina example of the past week where they actually passed that law. Um, although I don't know if the governor signed it, but they passed that law mandating uh, a linear, only considering a linear rate of sea level rise in their planning rather than the accelerated rise that most scientists say is going to happen. But one of the most fascinating examples is there are a lot of local level officials officials in Florida. And Florida's sort of got a very Republican administration. They have a Republican administration who's not really gun ho on talking about climate. The local level officials are doing a lot of things that make a lot of sense to plan for sea level rise and increased storm impacts and calling it other things than climate change adaptation. You know, they're they're calling it a bridge raising activity and not really talking about why? Or they're moving some of the, the, the wells further inland because salt water is intruding on them already. And talking to these people is just really fascinating because they, they get it. They're looking at the science. And in their case, it's actually like partnerships with local universities that are giving them more specific, tailored uh, guidance. And then they're working on it without going, you know, getting into the whole what's causing this, and can we get Republicans and Democrats on the same page? They're just sort of short-circuiting it. 
Yeah, so I think just to yeah. add to that, um, you know, there's there's certainly a policy dimension. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of what was what was mentioned in the in the question and comments was about climate adaptation. You know, well, well you know, if we're committed to some climate change, then what are we going to do about it? And there are policies you know, in, in the U.S. and outside the U.S., but certainly around the U.S. that that um, are are aimed uh, very clearly at climate adaptation, adapting to climate change that is occurring and that, that is expected to occur in the future. Um, and in some cases, these are, these are laws at the state level, and in some cases, they're, they're policies at, at more local levels. Um, so that I, there, there certainly is, is uh, policy action in, um, in the adaptation domain. And I think it's also important to add that there's a marketplace component to this as well, right? If someone says, I'm, you know, hearing a lot about climate change, and I've decided that uh, I think that the optimal temperature for growing corn is going to be north of where it is now, and I want to buy some land there. Uh, people can do it, and there's certainly anecdotal evidence of people doing that um, for various crops. But um, you know, there's nothing, there's no, there's no policy need for for those kind of marketplace responses. So in some ways, the the um, the, the, there's a lot more flexibility in the adaptation domain than um, mitigation domain, simply because you know for reducing uh, reducing the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations, stabilizing the global greenhouse gas concentrations at some level, there, it really requires um, you know kind of big, broad uh, uh, reductions in in the uh, the rate of of emissions, uh, and that that requires much, much uh, broader agreement, um, at least it has no, as so far. Uh, that's very interesting. I, what, what I think you've just said, or what I've understood, is that the market, the, you know, the mysterious market, whatever that thing is, will probably do a good job of adapting, but that, and it doesn't require being, what's the right word, it doesn't require a political consensus for a person or a corporation to make a decision that it needs to live in Canada. But uh, the concept of mm, slowing, perhaps, this event requires a lot of political work. Okay, so let me get back to those, that market thing again. Since we don't see a lot of yeah, more than anecdotal behavior that says, yeah, where I am right now, like I have business, let's say, in Manhattan Island. Manhattan Island has got to be one of the really bad places to be if you have a five-foot sea level rise. It's going to take an awful lot of very valuable real estate and make it not very valuable at all. It's certainly going to make it tough on the subway system. So. There doesn't seem to be much in the way of response by these folks who have money to lose. Why is that? Well, Manhattan's a great example. So, I mean, for, first of all, I, I'm not arguing that the market will do a good job of adapting. I, I have no no judgment about whether the market will do a good job or a bad job. But but okay. but it has the ability. Right? People have the ability to say, I'm going to make this this decision based on this information, and you know, adaptation is ultimately very local individual kind of response. Um, but but Manhattan, Manhattan is a good example because the city of New York actually has created an adaptation plan, right, and actually is taking actions. Uh, it also has, you know, a, a mitigation plan, right? It also has a plan for um, re trying to reduce the carbon footprint of the city. But uh, the the mitigation part of that, what, what New York does, um, to reduce its its emissions by um, you know, increasing public transport and um, you know, trying to decrease congestion, increase bike traffic, etc. Right? Th those are going to have a, a very 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 minor impact on the global greenhouse gas concentrations. On the other hand, Manhattan's adaptation will be you know, driven essentially entirely by what Manhattan does, and so the ability to kind of pull the lever and the size of the lever uh, is, is much more local for adaptation. And, and like I say, there, you can actually go to the web right now and download the City of New York Adaptation Plan. And actually, what you're asking for actually has been, has been done and now in terms of the planning and now it's being executed. 
Neat. Could, I had not heard that. Thanks. Uh, couldn't that, while we don't have a national plan, um, couldn't like a New York City or a Los Angeles? I mean, all of our buses out here run on clean natural gas, etc. There is all such the a thing. All the trash trucks have gone for it. If there is such a thing, right? Well, clean natural gas, <laughs> not coal. Natural. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I haven't heard too much argument about that one. Um, but since Los Angeles is trying to do it in a pretty good-sized way, California has some very aggressive plans for solar, et cetera, uh, as does Arizona. Couldn't New York City serve as a world example of here's how you plan for something? Here's how you mitigate something? I mean, I don't know. It's well, always, actually, uh, I thought so. Yeah, I mean, there's two things. One, um, at the federal level, the government is trying to organize um, through, you know, to come up with a climate adaptation framework and task force and all sorts of stuff um, that just happens more slowly than it does on the local level. Um, but there's also all sorts of city initiatives where mayors have gotten together uh, and Mayor Bloomberg and Bill Clinton are heavily involved in um, funding these initiatives, in some of these initiatives, to try to to try to take use all sorts of different cities to implement adaptation policies and learn from each other and take it you know more broad scale. Um, we've been we've been going for about forty minutes, so I want to don't want to hold people hostage. Um, but there there is a, a question again from Carlos here about hurricanes uh, and. And uh, the, what what kind of um, hurricane year we might expect this year, and uh, and interaction with uh, El Nino, um, and uh, Andrew, you've been looking at the at the hurricane statistics. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, it's it's a weird season so far because we got off to uh, the fastest start either in in observational history or we tied the fastest start. Um, but that doesn't really have any meaning for the rest of the season. And the most indications are that we're looking for a near average, just slightly below average hurricane season in the Atlantic. Um, if El Nino does come on towards the end of the hurricane season, it would tend to uh, lessen hurricane activity because it creates a little bit harsher winds in the atmosphere uh, over the Atlantic. So, you know, it only takes one storm um, you know, 1992 was an inactive year, um, and that was uh, Hurricane Andrew, uh, which is the 20th, 20th anniversary, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, they're watching it, but usually July is not even a very active month. It was just a totally freak uh, June. Uh, and Florida can thank, uh, you know, the tropical storm for it, because uh, it ended pretty much ended Florida's drought, even though drought has expanded in almost every other area of the United States. Yeah, so the way these, the way these uh, hurricane predictions work, and just prediction, you know, seasonal climate predictions in general, is um, people have developed uh, statistical relationships, uh, in particular with sea surface temperatures. So you can say, well, if the, if the sea surface temperatures uh, in the winter uh, look like this, then what's kind of a statistical relationship uh, in the following uh, hurricane season uh, with those sea surface temperatures? And people do this for snowpack in the western U.S. and rainfall over the central U.S., et cetera, as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the statistical approach is to, to say, here's the, here are the initial sea surface temperature conditions, uh, and generate these, these statistical distributions, and then you have some X percent chance that there are Y number of named storms in the coming season. Uh, the other way is what's called dynamical prediction, where a model of the atmosphere is run um, with those sea surface temperatures. And there are all kinds of ways of, of accounting for the noise in, in the climate system. And uh, scientists create a huge, what we call ensemble of, of these dynamical simulations. And then you can analyze the statistics of that ensemble. Um, so it, the uh, if there's an outlook for for the season, uh, you know, as Andrew said, it's it's early in the year, and this is important. Uh, you can think of it as kind of like a baseball player. If you 
the beginning of the baseball season is a little bit arbitrary. There's maybe some inertia from spring training and people's skills not being quite up to up to snuff. But for the most part, if you just take a snapshot of any of any part of the season and look at one baseball player's statistics, you could be kind of in a in a good part of their statistics or you know in a slump part. And the beginning of the season is is pretty arbitrary. So if someone has you know four home runs in the first week of the baseball season, there aren't many people that would just interpolate out over 162 games and say, wow, you know, they're going to, they're on pace for, for 120 home runs. Let's go bet on that. Uh, and so it's kind of the same with the hurricane season that, um, you know, early in the season, if you happen to have uh, some early storms, there might be some physical reasons for that, but there also might be some statistical chance contributing to that. Um, the El Nino part is interesting, and this is a really active area of, of research right now, how, how El Nino and La Nina affect um, affect uh, tropical cyclones both in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and in particular the different flavors of El Nino, um, whether uh, w exactly what the El Nino looks like in the tropical Pacific can have a big effect on the steering of storms uh, in the Atlantic. So that's, that's an area of, uh, that Andrew mentioned that's, that's really an area of current active research. Um, all right, I want to uh, I I make sure we let everybody go here. I want to only Tom's got a question for you. Yeah, yes. I, I, yes, I, fire away. Uh, I'm from India, uh, but I'm doing a I'm student here. So in India, we are also seeing in the media reports about drought setting in, uh, the monsoon being late and stuff like that. And people were discussing even you are seeing the, in during this season in United States too. You are having this thing. So. Is it a global thing, which is we are seeing this year that there is a drought kind of situation, or is um, it only parts of? Well, so you know, we certainly there is. Uh, this is something also that we've we've worked on and published recently. Uh, taking a global look at this question of of uh, severe dry and severe wet, and we do expect theoretically that with global warming, there'll be more intense rainfall, and. Um, more uh, pronounced dry spells. And I was involved in two papers that have just come out uh, in the last 12 months, taking different, looking at this in different ways. And, and in fact, in both of those studies, we did find that, that, that there is an emergence of this phenomenon of there being longer dry spells, and then when it does rain, being the rain, rainfall being much more intense. So anecdotally, what we're hearing about is consistent with that. I think it's really important to remember that there's just a lot of noise in the system, and, and you're, it, you're, there's some there's some odds, uh, just from random chance, that you're going to hear about something happening somewhere in the world, and uh, we want to be cautious about uh, what we attribute that uh, to uh, outside of just the the noise in the very complex system. So I tend my, I tend to be conservative uh, in my in my evaluation. Again, the null hypothesis is that it's happening by chance, and then there's a very large burden of proof to prove that. That it's not from random chance. Um, so I would naively, not knowing anything else, I'd just say, well, assume it's random chance, and then uh, look further. Um, but certainly, we do we do expect that that in addition to that that noise, that in general, most locations will will uh, tend to see uh, more intense rainfall and and longer periods between rainfall. But that hasn't that hasn't been observed uh, everywhere in the world yet uh, as actually happening. Um, does that help to answer the question? All right. Um, well, I want to I want to thank everyone for participating. I uh, I really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Uh, I got a lot of perspective. So I'm particular to thank Andrew for for joining us for uh, co-hosting this. Um, and I'll certainly uh, be posting more of these. Uh, so thanks to all of you who've who've joined in the hangout. I'll hit you up again uh, for further participation. And thank you all who. Uh, who are viewing uh, outside there in, in the real world. Um, and uh, until next time, um, thanks a lot, and, and uh, have a great day, and, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, I appreciate your help here. Thanks. Thanks, Noah.